Lighthouse Scientific Education presents a lecture in the Molecules and Compound Series. The topic, Bonding, an overview. This is the first lecture in this series and provides basic concepts and descriptions. The overview will start with an explanation of the bond, an exploration of bonding and energy, including bond association energy and the underlying forces that drive binding. We will also take a preliminary look at the types of bonds, specifically covalent, polar covalent, ionic, metallic, and crystalline solids. The final topic is the role of electronegativity in determining bond type. So what exactly is the bond? A bond is the joining of two or more atoms or ions under a force of attraction. Most bonds covered at this level of chemistry contain only a few atoms, but some compounds can have hundreds or thousands of chemical bonds. And what actually do we mean by the term compound? Well, it's any atom or ions that are joined together. Compound is a broad, inclusive term for joined particles. Later we will see that the common term for a group of atoms, molecule, is really just a type of compound. To understand bonding, we need to explore energy. Here is a common graph or diagram device used to compare the amount of energy in a chemical reaction. It is called a reaction coordinate. Reading left to right, there is a before platform that marks the energy of all the material that goes into a reaction. And then after some time, there is an after platform that marks the energy of all the material present after the reaction. The reaction coordinate is like an XY coordinate system used when plotting. Since the diagram holds terms like before and after, it should not be surprising that it is really a graph based on time. The X axis is the time axis. The Y axis is the total energy of the material as it undergoes a chemical reaction. The reaction coordinate is a way to visualize the change in energy as a reaction proceeds. As this reaction coordinate is set up, the before energy is higher or greater than the after energy. We can use the coordinate system and put a cartoon of two atoms that are initially not bound together in the before platform. The after platform of the reaction will have those two atoms bound together. The chemical reaction of this reaction coordinate is the binding of two atoms. So we have a timeline with a visual representation of how much energy there is in the material before and after the reaction. But we're going to stick with the before and after terms with this reaction. The real terms of the chemical reaction are the reactants for material before the reaction and products for the material present after the reaction, just so that we know. As we can see from the diagram of this reaction, that when going from before to after, there's a change of energy. In this case, it is a release of energy. Going from a higher value on the y-axis to a lower value is a decrease. The bonded atoms in the after platform do not have this difference in energy, and it is released. Where that energy goes is not a subject of this overview. We need only be aware that it is not in the bonded atoms. Reactions that release energy are referred to as favorable. That just means that they are likely to occur. It says nothing about how fast their reaction will occur. Another feature of the reaction coordinate is called the activation energy and it is the addition of energy to the reactants to get the reaction to proceed. In our reaction, separate atoms forming a bonded pair of atoms, the additional energy needed is small and can come from the motion of the atoms. However, in many chemical reactions, there is a breaking of chemical bonds in the material that make up the reactants before the formation of new ones in the products. In this circumstance, the activation energy reflects the energy needed to break those bonds. It should also be noted 
that the activation energy is not considered part of the energy difference in the reaction because the energy put into breaking bonds is released again. We can think of the activation energy as an extra energy needed to get the reaction to occur. It is returned in full and will therefore not be considered as part of the energy of the reaction. There are other arrangements for reaction coordinates that reflect different levels of energy and a different direction for a reaction, including this reaction. We can reverse this reaction, that is having bonded atoms as the before reactants, which undergo a chemical reaction that breaks the bond, leaving individual atoms as the products or the after material. From this perspective, energy has to be added to or energy is consumed by the reaction in order for the bonded atoms to break apart. That energy consumed is the same size of the energy that was released when the reaction was written in the other direction. The law of conservation of energy says that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It just changes forms. In other words, for a reaction and its reverse reaction, the energy released in one direction is the same magnitude or size as the energy consumed in the other direction. Reactions that consume energy are referred to as unfavorable and are not likely to occur on their own. Unfavorable says nothing about the speed of the reaction. Of importance to note, the energy consumed in breaking a bond is called the bond dissociation energy. Breaking bonds takes energy. And as we just saw with the reaction going in the other direction, making bonds releases energy. Do all atoms form bonds and release energy? The short answer is no. Not all atoms interact to form bonds. Not all bond formation releases energy. That means some bond formation is unfavorable. Using this reaction coordinate, we see a situation in which the before energy of two unbonded atoms is less than the energy when they are bonded. Energy is consumed in bond formation making this bond unfavorable. How does a student know whether or not a bond is formed? Well, there are some basic properties that we will cover that lets us begin to understand the question. But in general, students are not expected to be able to predict likely bonding with the exception of well-known compounds such as water and salt, sodium chloride. Before we get to the types of bonds, we should look at the underlying forces that compel certain atoms to join. We will not need to introduce any new forces. The forces we have covered that are within an atom will be sufficient. Consider two generic atoms, atoms A and atom B. They both have positively charged protons in their nuclei. Since atoms are neutral, each atom will have the same number of negatively charged electrons as protons. Electrons are zipping around the nucleus so we will draw that movement as an electron cloud. It gives the atoms a proper volume. There are four forces at work between these two atoms. First, the negatively charged electrons in atom A are attracted to the positively charged nucleus in atom B. Negative and positive charges attract. Then there are the negatively charged electrons in atom B which are attracted to the positively charged nucleus in atom A. Again, positive and negative attract. Importantly, the negatively charged electrons of atom A and B repulse each other. Negative and negative charges repel. And the same thing can be said of the positively charged nuclei in atoms A and B. They also repulse or repel each other. Positive and positive charges repel. Bonding is a competition between the forces of attraction and the forces of repulsion. Opposite charges bring atoms together and like charges push atoms apart. Bonding, however, is not simply a matter of the attraction forces being greater than the repulsion forces. Because the construction of the atom, the forces of attraction and repulsion change with the distance between the atoms. To understand bonding, we need to see how these forces change as atoms approach each other. To show this, we will bring back atoms A and B and create a graph 
that shows the relationship between the sum of the attraction and repulsion forces as a function of the distance between the two atoms. The y-axis will be the energy axis and will refer to the summed attraction repulsion energy as a potential energy, much like a compressed spring has potential energy. The red line indicates where the total attraction energy is equal to the total propulsion energy. The x-axis is the distance dependency. In other words, how far apart the nuclei of atoms A and B are from each other. Beneath the red line are distances where there is a net attraction between the atoms. This occurs when the total attraction energy is greater than the total repulsion. The deeper the graph goes, in the net attraction, the greater the attraction energy is compared to the repulsion energy. Deeper means more. Above the red line is where there are distances that there is a net repulsion between the two atoms. Here the repulsive energy is greater than the attraction energy. The higher the line goes, the greater the repulsion is compared to the attraction. To give a graphic demonstration, we will bring atom B closer to a stationary atom A and monitor the potential energy between the atoms. As drawn here, noted by the star on the graph, when the atoms are far apart, there's only a slight net attraction. As the atoms are brought closer together, the forces of attraction become noticeably stronger than the forces of repulsion. The net attraction increases. As the distance between the nuclei shortens, the net attraction becomes greater and greater. There comes a distance between nuclei where the net attraction is a maximum. To bring the atoms much closer than this puts the atoms in a region where the energies of repulsion are greater than the energies of attraction. At this point, even a small decrease in the distance between the nuclei results in a very large increase in net repulsion. It is at the maximum net attraction that the atoms form a bond. The distance between the nuclei at that maximum net attraction is called the bond length. Here it is given not as a particular distance, but a short range of distances. Atoms jiggle in their bonds. The potential energy at that maximum net attraction is the energy released upon bond formation. That same amount of energy is what is needed to break that bond. And as we've seen already, it's called the bond dissociation energy. Chemistry is ultimately a study of energy. Now to bond type. There are two major categories of bonding, chemical and intermolecular. Chemical bonds are within a compound. Intermolecular bonds are between compounds. Chemical or stronger bonds. Intermolecular are weaker and include van der Waals dipole bonding and hydrogen bonds. These bonding types are discussed in the intermolecular bonding lecture. We will only concern ourselves in this lecture with chemical bonds. Five types of chemical bonds will be introduced, beginning with a covalent bond. These occur between two nonmetal atoms which share one or more of their electrons and they do so more or less equally. Refreshing ourselves with which atoms are considered as nonmetals, we see that they are located to the right of that staircase of elements, colored pink here. Elements like nitrogen and oxygen and chlorine have nonmetal atoms. Covalent bond compounds are called molecules. Molecules are a subset of compounds. All molecules are compounds, but not all compounds are molecules. One often sees a line drawn between two atoms, and this indicates that there's a covalent bond between them. Another important feature of the covalent bond is that an orbital with a shared electron from one atom overlaps with the orbital with the shared electron on the other atom. The atoms not only touch, but to a small degree, they merge. This and other features of the covalent bond are discussed in more detail in the covalent bonding lecture. On to the second type of bond, and that is the polar covalent bond. It too is the sharing of some electrons between two nonmetal atoms, but the sharing is done 
unequally. The shared electrons spend more time around one of the atoms. The unequal sharing leads to one of the atoms in the bond gaining a slight negative charge at the expense of the other atom, which subsequently adopts a slight positive charge. The slight is called partial and is symbolized by the lower Greek case letter delta. This topic is discussed in detail in the covalent bonding lecture under the subtopic polarity. Partial positive and partial negative charges can be added to a representation of a molecule, highlighting that uneven distribution of the electrons. Compounds with polar covalent bonds are called molecules. The line is used to distinguish a covalent bond. And orbitals of the shared electrons overlap a bit. This and other features of the bond are discussed in more detail in the covalent bonding lecture. The third type of bonding to be introduced is ionic bonding. It results from the attraction of a positively charged ion to a negatively charged ion. Often the positive ion, a cation, is a metal and the negative ion, the anion, is a nonmetal. A look at the periodic table shows us that metal cations can be found on the left of the table as well as the transition metals and some of the heavier main group elements. And again, the nonmetals are located to the right of that staircase. Unlike covalent bonds, ionic bonds are not considered molecules, but are just called compounds. Also, unlike covalent bonds, ionic bonds do not involve the overlap of orbitals. As a preview, ionic compounds form crystals. Pictured here is a crystal lattice. This and other features of the ionic bond are discussed in more detail in the ionic bonding lecture. The fourth type of bond we will cover is the metallic bond. We will consider these as being made of pure metal. There are mixtures of metal called alloys, but we'll stay with the pure metal for now. The periodic table shows us many of the common metals we have had exposure to, including copper, zinc, gold, and silver. Metallic bonding is not a topic covered in much detail at this level of chemistry. Referring back to electronic configurations, we know that transition metals have d orbital valence electrons. These electrons are not as strongly held by the atom's nucleus. Another way of saying that is that their valence electrons are delocalized, not limited to the radius of the atom. One can roughly describe delocalized electrons as a sea of electrons surrounded by the positively charged core of the atoms. A cartoon might help clarify this. Let's say that these hexagons represent the atoms without their valence electrons. That would mean that these atom cores have more protons than electrons and are therefore positively charged. The electrons as red spheres are free to move about the core of atoms. This is why metals such as copper are good conductors of electricity and heat. Electricity is the flowing of electrons. The last type of bonding is a broad category called crystalline solids. These solids have highly regular arrangements of atoms, ions, or molecules. That crystalline lattice we saw with the ionic bonds is just such an arrangement. Non-metal atoms bonded as crystalline solids can form what is called a covalent network. Carbide atoms form three different covalent network compounds. The different compounds arise from different highly regular arrangements of carbon atoms. Diamonds consist of a three-dimensional array of hexagons. This arrangement makes diamonds incredibly hard. For graphite, the arrangement is in sheets. Graphite is used in pencils since dragging the graphite across paper peels off and lays down a sheet of graphite. A late 20th century addition to the carbon network is the fullerene. This spherical arrangement is similar to that of a soccer ball and holds promise of exotic material properties. For molecular solids, there are manufactured crystals, such as those for proteins or sugars. A closer look at table sugar will show it to consist of small, regularly shaped crystals. Nature also makes crystals in the forms of rocks and gemstones. 
rubies, opals, and emeralds are all examples. The study of the chemistry of rocks is called geochemistry. That concludes the introduction to common chemical bonds. Let's take a closer look at the first three types of bonding. Covalent bonding, polar covalent bonding, and ionic bonding. A telling question is how well do they share electrons? Importantly, sharing means time. How much time do the shared electrons spend around one atom versus the other? We can use this triangle to demonstrate the magnitude of sharing. Covalent bonds share the most, practically equal. They get the widest part of the triangle. Then it is polar covalent bonds with its sharing but unequal sharing. And finally, ionic bonding has no sharing at all. Another way to look at this is to say that we have two atoms, atoms A and B. Atom A brings one electron to the covalent bond. Atom B brings one electron to the covalent bond. Both electrons spend the same amount of time around atom A as they do atom B. As drawn here, the electrons are exactly between A and B. The co in covalent bond means share. Using the same two atoms for the polar covalent bond, we can draw the shared electrons closer to atom A. Remember that sharing is about time, it's not about how close the electrons are drawn. The drawing of electrons closer to one atom is a way to visualize the unequal sharing from a perspective of time. This representation says that the shared electrons spend more time around atom A than atom B. Not to be outdone, using the AB representation, in an ionic bond, electrons spend all of their time around just one of the atoms. In this case, it's atom A. We should also note that since atom A has one of atom B's electrons, it has one more electron than protons and will therefore adopt a negative charge. Atom B has one less electron than protons and will adopt a positive charge. The ionic bond is an attraction of positive and negative ions. Bonding is about electrons and the types of bonding is about the distribution of the electrons. How does a student know which type of bond two atoms form? The answer is electronegativity. Our definition of electronegativity, or EN, is the capacity of an atom in the molecule to attract shared electrons from another atom. The thing is, that's actually very difficult to measure. Therefore, artificial scales have been developed to give relative strengths of the capacity to attract for the different atoms. The most common scale is the Pauling scale. Since noble gases are not very reactive, the scale generally does not include sharing capacities of these elements. The rest of the elements have sharing capacities ranging from 0.8 at the bottom left to 4.0 at the top right. We can see that the, the values decrease going down the table and increase going across the rows. The halogens have particularly high electronegativities. The alkali metals particularly low. See the lecture on periodic trends for more detail on electronegativity. And just how do we use the electronegativity scale to determine whether a bond between two atoms is covalent, polar covalent, or ionic? It is actually a rather straightforward process. Once again, we employ atoms A and B. The first thing to do is to get the electronegativity for both atoms in the bond. Once we have those values, we need to subtract the smaller value from the larger one. This will produce a positive number and is referred to as the difference in electronegativity. If you get a negative number, switch the values around. Take the difference in electronegativity to a bond scale. Most textbooks have one. Here's one. It goes from 0 to 3. If from step 2, the difference is 0 0.4 or less, the bond is covalent. If the difference is between 0 0.5 and 1.9, the bond is polar covalent. If, however, the difference is 2.0 or greater, the bond is ionic. While determining bond type does not seem particularly difficult, 
we should practice it anyways. We begin by determining the bond type for carbon-hydrogen. The first step tells us to get the electronegativity for both atoms. Referring to the Pauling scale, we see that carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5. Let's write that down. The electronegativity for hydrogen is 2.1. And write that down. Now we need to subtract the smaller value 2.1 from the larger value 2.5. The difference is 0 0.4, which we take to the bond scale and see that it falls into the covalent section. Not by much, but a covalent bond nevertheless. Okay, what about the bond between NaCl, sodium chloride? Our first step is to get the electronegativity for both atoms. According to the Pauling scale, sodium is 0 0.9. Write that down. And chlorine is 3.0. Write that down. Now we subtract the smaller value from the larger one, yielding a difference of 2.1, which we take to the bond scale and find the bond to be ionic. Our last example is the oxygen-hydrogen bond. Going to the electronegativity, we find oxygen to have a value of 3.5 and hydrogen a value of 2.1. Now we subtract the smaller value from the larger one, yielding a difference of 1.4, which we take to the bond scale and find the bond to be polar covalent. Oxygen with a larger electronegativity has the shared electrons for a longer amount of time. Electronegativity scale gives us a straightforward process for identifying Bond type. Recapping the lecture. A bond is the joining of two or more atoms or ions under a force of attraction. When atoms or ions join, they are considered a compound. Bond formation is favorable when energy is released upon bonding. We investigated this using a reaction coordinate. It compared the before and after energies of a chemical reaction. The energy for breaking a bond is called the bond dissociation energy. Bond formation is considered unfavorable when energy is consumed upon bonding. That was when the before energy was greater than the after. Bonding between atoms, and we use the generic atoms A and B, is driven by the net sum of four forces. The electrons in atom A are attracted to the nucleus in atom B. The electrons in atom B are attracted to the nucleus in atom A. The electrons in atoms A and B repulse each other. And finally, the nuclei in atom A and B repulse each other. The first two energies pull the atoms together, the last two push them apart. When the distance between nuclei is plotted against energy, the maximum net attraction is at the lowest point of the graph, and this corresponds to the bond dissociation energy and the bond length. There are five types of chemical bonds covered in this lecture. Covalent, atoms share an electron or electrons and do so approximately equally. Covalent bonded compounds are called molecules. A similar bond is the polar covalent bond Atoms share an electron or electrons and do so unequally. Sharing means time. And in a polar bond, one atom has the shared electrons longer than the other. Polar covalent bonded compounds are called molecules. The third type is the ionic bond. And it results from the attraction of a cation, a metal ion, to an anion, a nonmetal ion. Ionic compounds are not called molecules. They are just called compounds. The fourth type of bond is called metallic. It can be considered as a sea of electrons around an array of the positively charged core of atoms. As such, metals are good conductors of electricity. The last bond type we saw is crystalline solids. These are highly regular arrangements of atoms, ions, or molecules. We saw that the atom carbon can form three types of covalent network 
crystalline solids. Molecular solids can be produced crystals like sugar or natural crystals like rocks and gemstones. The difference in electronegativity between two atoms determines their bond type. When the difference is between 0 and 0 0.4, the bond is considered covalent. A difference between 0 0.5 and 1.9 yields a polar covalent bond. If the difference is greater than 2, the bond is ionic. And that concludes the overview of bonding. Head out to the individual lectures on the bond types to expand your understanding.